Awesome. So we're just going to go ahead and get started because we're already six minutes late. Um, Kelty and who else is it here? Kelty and Kelly. Kelly, hi. You are my heroes, and you're going to get a private screening today, um, which I'm really excited about because I uh, totally reworked this presentation based on feedback and um, you know what people really liked about it and what was confusing uh, because sometimes I can get really technical. Uh, so I tried to make it a lot more consumable um, and better for you guys. So um, awesome. I'm going to show my screen. It's going to be like the whoa black hole of me present to everyone ah i love that it's like vortex Brrr. okay so i want to first say make sure that you have the workbook which is um to the left of the screen um where the chat is it says click here to download the workshop workbook we're going to be um we're going to be using that later and you're going to need it. So download it now uh, so you have it for later. Also, I want you to stay to the end with me because, not just because you're going to get so much awesome stuff, but you'll also get your hands on these free gifts. Um, so if you stay to the end, I'll show you how to get these awesome goodies. I pulled them right from the course. Um, they really help you walk you through step by step how to um, take it to the next level and master your Mac. Okay, awesome. So before we get started, don't try to multitask. I guarantee that, you know, <laughs> distractions are going to pop up. Do not go away from this presentation. This is a productivity workshop, people. That's like eating a donut at a gym. So do yourself a favor and stay with me. The best thing you can do right now is eliminate distractions. So put your phone somewhere else, close everything else down. I want you to really be really focused on all the value you're going to get here today. I promise that I'm going to here and focus with you and I want you to do the same thing too. Okay, so I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking that your situation is so bad that it can't be fixed. Now, that's a common fear. You might be thinking I, that you're simply not an organized person, that you've never been. So even if I tell you what to do, you probably won't do it. Or you may be thinking that all the knowledge in the world isn't going to help because you simply don't have enough time or energy to focus on getting organized right now. And that's a legitimate worry. We only have so much time in a day. So I want you to tell me why you're here. Why did you come today, Kelty? Um, Tell me the comments who you are. I cannot see the comments right now, um, but when I pop out uh, for Q and A, uh, they'll be there, and I get to know more about you, which is which is the part about all these workshops that I love the most. Now, I want you to remember that practice makes progress, not perfect. So, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to clean up our dock and our desktop, and it might not be perfect when we leave, but we're going to start to implement these better ways of work day, working practices. And by just, it's both a practice in terms of um, a new way of doing something, and then we're also practicing it um, just to get a little bit better over time so that we can take control of our digital lives. So, here's what we're going to accomplish today we're going to have a completely clean and organized desktop and dock. I'm going to show you a system that allows you to instantly find any file on your computer with two keystrokes. It's amazing. And a folder naming system that will organize all your stuff and keep it organized. And we'll go through those things um, step by step. Actually starting with number three, then going to number two, and then going to number one. I guess it's kind of flipped. Now I want to tell you a little bit about myself, about me. We can hop in the time machine uh, really quick and go back to 2007 in January. 2007 and 2015, I built a very successful career helping brands like these use social media to connect with their customers. And during that time, I also built a really strong personal brand. That might be why you were here. You know me on Twitter or Facebook. And I was a fully digital girl, immersed in a digital world, and I was crushing it. I was featured in Vanity Fair magazine as one of America's tweethearts. I've been featured in Huffington Post and Forbes several times. I was given an award by my college. Uh, most successful since graduating in my class, um, but I graduated with mediocre grades to which a degree that I've never used. And to this day, I'm still considered a social media influencer. But it wasn't until late 2013 that 2013 that this really happy and on top of it digital girl had a very real digital meltdown. It was a long time coming, and I'm going to tell you how, how it all went down, because I think you will relate, not to my specific story, but to the situation that I found myself in. 
It was 2011 and I was living in New York City with a cushy job as VP of Marketing at Manila, a startup incubated and financed solely by the Hearst Corporation. If you're not familiar with the Hearst Corporation, this is the Hearst Tower in New York City where I went to work every day. Not too shabby, huh? Let me show you inside. First you walk into the lobby, wave to the security guy. Hi security guys, they're super nice. You head up the escalator. Yep, it's surrounded by a giant waterfall. You pass by the lounge on your way to the elevators, where, which were insane, by the way. They were the most technologically advanced elevators I'd ever seen. They were smart and they were fast. They could get you from the second floor to the 60th floor within a matter of seconds. My ears would pop every time. And they were super popular with the fashionistas because they had great lighting and floor to ceiling mirrors. No joke, these elevators were legit. And although this was not my exact office, this is the view I remember very well. And I find it ironic that with a view like this, I felt completely trapped. When I wasn't chained to my desk or stuck in long meetings, I was on my way between the two. I cried on Sundays because I didn't want to go to work on Monday. I had worked so hard to get to where I was, but deep down, I knew that I had to get out. I felt alone. I felt like a piece of this corporate puzzle that just didn't quite fit. So I left. Instead of finding another nine to five job, I made the big decision to try to make it on my own. I was self-employed and working beside my also self-employed boyfriend that you can see here in our one bedroom apartment in New York City. And when I say working beside Clay, I mean working right beside Clay. This is where I spent most of my day and evening. But something happened during this time when I went from the role of corporate uh, executive to you know, entrepreneur or attempting to make it entrepreneur, really just a freelance uh, consultant. And it was every time I opened up my MacBook, I felt like I was being crushed under the weight of everything I had to manage. The most common tasks like checking email, searching for files, just felt unbearable. And rationally, I knew this was ridiculous. But I swear, as soon as I flipped open my computer, my brain stopped working. My focus was fried. I couldn't pay attention to anything for more than a few minutes. I'm sure you can relate to just being scattered. But it was all the time and I couldn't prioritize, set goals, or make decisions if I was looking at my computer, if I was staring into the screen. I didn't know how to make sense of why I was struggling so much uh, and I just couldn't seem to get past it. So I dived into understanding how the brain works to help understand what was happening. Um, and since then I've read hundreds of scientific studies and read dozens of books about the brain and I've tried and tested all of the top productivity systems and all the, all the all the brain uh, focused systems to see what works. And, and I started to test everything learning on myself, right? And I've been creating, testing, and evolving new and better ways of working ever since. I am obsessed. I love the brain. And if you haven't read any brain based books lately, I highly recommend it. They are fascinating. And you will learn a lot about yourself. What I began to uncover and really understand is that technology isn't the problem. We are. We allow it to take over because it serves as an extension of us, an extension of our mind. And we desperately need it to help us handle everything, to handle the unprecedented amount of information we have to remember and all the small things that we're expected to keep track of. Yet we treat it like a big disorganized drawer, you know, like the one everyone has, has in their kitchen, the junk drawer. Our computing machines, quote unquote, have become large and glorious and fantastically disorganized kitchen drunk drawers full of photos, tax documents, games, articles to read, to-do lists, books, screensavers of cats wearing party hats, music, contacts, emails, calendars. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. But the real problem is we don't realize that our brain doesn't separate our real world from our digital world. It doesn't see or experience those two worlds differently. So all the things in your digital world, vacation photos, Google chats, emails, video conferencing, are all experienced the same way that face-to-face -face conversations are, bumping into an old friend on the way to lunch, window shopping at the mall, are all experienced the same way. Now, you might be thinking, this is weird because I know the difference. I'm looking at my computer right now and that's digital and then if I you know, walk to the bathroom, that's real world. But beneath the surface of our conscious awareness, in the more primitive part of our mind, there's no difference. Your mind doesn't see reality, it interprets and responds to our environment, to your environment, whether that environment is digital or physical. 
A great example of this is how we experience pictures and photographs. How is it that we can look at a flat piece of paper with a motionless picture on it and start to feel happy or sad or feel like we were there even if we weren't and even have emotions even if the picture is of someone else? So our digital environment affects our state of mind, happiness, and productivity the same way that our real world environment does. You know, just because it's a photo doesn't mean that your mind isn't seeing that and reliving it or you know, getting happiness from seeing you know, a photo of your mother that you've never seen before. It's, you're not seeing your mother then in reality. It doesn't have to be real to have the same impact on your mind. And this is critical to understand this because we understand that our physical environment the fact that it, you know, it should be organized and things should be where they, they should be because that'll increase our productivity, our happiness, all of that. So we'll tidy up our desk and we'll clean up our house um, to put ourselves in a better mood. But we haven't translated that to our digital environment. So when your desktop's cluttered with files and your downloads folder, folder is full, your mind sees it all as real stuff. This is pre precisely why an influx of new emails, a never-ending to-do list, important documents that are waiting to be reviewed can trigger thoughts and feelings like, oh, I have so much to do. Why is all this not done yet? There's important stuff I'm missing. I just know it. Oh, man, I forgot about that. I'm so behind. I'm never going to catch up. As you can tell, I feel that way sometimes. Before I learned about how to deal with all of this, the most I could hope for every day was getting through the things I had to get done without hating every minute of it. That was an amazing day. Now my relationship with my technology and the work I create is collaborative and fun. And that is because I've totally transformed the way I think about and use my technology. And since that major shift, I've not only been able to do so much more than ever before, I'm happier, less stressed, and at peace with what I'm able to accomplish in a given day. And that's really all we can hope for. And so now I teach other people how they can do the same thing. I've helped hundreds of people master their technology and transform the way that they work, and I love it. And I'm excited to share some of that excitement and knowledge with you right now. It's new and improved Digital Sanity Workshop. All right, now it's time to get to the meat, the juicy stuff. So if you're multitasking right now, which I told you not to do in the first place, but that's okay, head back over because you're going to want to see these screens in order for any of this to make sense and then we're gonna eat our brain like spaghetti. So where do we start? We start with an unusual but very effective file and folder naming system that makes organizing your stuff a breeze. When I was in the very early stages of creating this system, I quickly realized that the most common and default way that my Mac binder would sort and display my files and folders was alphabetically in descending order, right? But I wanted my files and folders to list themselves so that all of my active projects and important files I was currently working on would sit on top, followed by folders and files that are secondary importance to me. And under all that, all of my administrative and archive stuff I've saved for reference. And on the bottom, just the rest of it, all the stuff that I rarely need, maybe synced folders, whatever. But in a sequential alphabetical ordering system, which is the default, sometimes important project folders and files would be buried somewhere in the middle based on their name. And this always frustrated me because if the name of an important project I was currently working on, take this course for example, didn't start with the letter A, it would be buried somewhere in the middle or even on the bottom. And it's the same case with files. By default, your finder will order all of your files like they do your folders by their name. I could never find anything. So my first attempt to make it better, I started putting numbers in front of the most accessed current project folders and files I was working on. And I'm sure you're nodding your head because you've probably done this too. But this strategically, it, bat it backfires pretty quickly because everything eventually is numbered or lettered and it looks like a jumbled mess. Then I stumbled across something very interesting. Special characters order themselves above every number and every letter when sorted alphabetically. Here's an abbreviated list of special characters that I started to play with. This is how they list themselves alphabetically. So underscores on top, then hyphen, then parentheses, and bracket, then curly bracket. And this will order itself always above every letter and every number. The only thing that they compete with for the highest order alphabetically is themselves. So if you put one of these special characters in front of a file name, it will automatically put it on top 
listing, listing it above everything else that doesn't have a special character. When listed with special characters, this is how it lists itself, but, it, but again, the important thing to understand here is that special characters pull whatever you're saving up to the top if you put it in front of the file name or the folder name. And there are a lot of characters to consider, and I go way in depth in, you know, into this in the course, but um, quickly, I chose parentheses bracket backslash for folders and underscore hyphen and angle bracket for files so that this is how they automatically sort themselves alphabetically. By simply adding one of the special characters to a file or folder, I automatically give it an importance marker. So by adding the underscore, that's that sits on top of everything. The hyphen is second in is second in line, and then parentheses bracket backslash. Um, it's oh, that's hashtag. It should be backslash. Okay. So let me sh show you how this looks. This is my digital sanity project folder. It's where I store every single document, image, presentation, outline, video, whatever related to this course. So if we look inside. By using my special character prefixes, I'm able to control how all my important digital sanity files and subfolders organize themselves. So the, M, the underscore M3 framework slide at the time that I took the screenshot was the, uh, the keynote deck I was working on to create some of the content for uh, the course. And then beneath that is a template that I would use to create all the workbooks. And then within the folders, you know, keynotes were on top and then worksheets were on top because that's what I was working on. And then beneath that, in the brackets, are assets, scripts, videos, you know, the things that I created, I uploaded the video, I, I might want to go back to it and look at it, but I don't really need it anymore. That can sit more at the bottom. Doesn't that look organized? I love it. Now, I've been working on this system and evolving it for a long time. And it's pretty overwhelming to think I have to put all these special characters in front of all my stuff now. But I started really simply, and that's what I'd recommend you do too. So I recommend starting with just two special character prefixes. Parentheses for your most active accessed folders and underscore for your most accessed active files. So look at your current foldering system now and say, what am I working on right now? What's important to me? What am I constantly accessing that's buried in the middle or on the bottom? and put a parentheses around it. In the front, I, you, all you have to do is put a parentheses in the front of the file name um, or of the folder name. But I like to put one at the end too because then it just gives it like a you know, consistent look, right? It just looks good. And then for files and underscore, again, like you know, underscore in the beginning will pull it up to the top, but then I like to um, put another hyphen at the end to make it look good. And I'll show you what I mean by the two hyphens in the next section here. But parentheses, underscore that will pull them to the top okay now we're going to get to the secret of file naming which will kind of bring together what we just learned and uh and, and kind of give you a complete picture of what we're looking at okay so the secret to file name is actually more like a special trick kind of like the uh special characters that's a powerful one because if you use it consistently you'll always be able to find what you're looking for quickly and easily even if you don't remember where you put it um, you'll never look at the at searching for your files the same way again. Uh, and I'm going to show you exactly um, what it is. But first, I want to make sure you can wrap your head around the idea that it really is all about search now. My argument, well, I should say that Google's and Apple's argument first, um, is that search is so good now that it shouldn't matter where you save something because you can always find it by searching relevant keywords, right? This makes sense. Why should we worry about where something is saved if we can always find it quickly via just searching for it? Of course, the problem is, is that finding what we're looking for isn't always easy, right? You know, we can't think of the right keywords to find something or when the keywords we are searching for brings up too many irrelevant search results, uh, you know, that becomes a problem too. So it's all about naming. If it's all about searching, then what's important is that we name things properly. Right? So right now we name most of the things we save on our computer haphazardly. We just want to download whatever it is from the internet and save whatever is we need um, or whatever we're working on as quickly as possible so we can be done and move on to the next thing. But if you always want to find what you're looking for, 
no matter where you've put it, the solution is surprisingly simple. All you have to do is add um, a special keyword, a simple keyword, to your files when you name them. Not the same keyword, but we'll get into that. OK, so as an example, how I use keyword naming. Any and every document, image, PDF, whatever that I've created related to this Digital Sanity Workshop and my overall Digital Sanity course starts with the acronym DS. It doesn't matter if it's an image for this presentation, a stock photo for my Digital Sanity sales page, a video file for the Digital Sanity course, a text file I saved years ago when merely brainstorming this idea. It all starts with DS. I've created this two-letter classification, DS, for everything I saved on my computer that's related to this workshop and my course. This is what it looks like inside my finder. As you can see, every file is prefixed with DS. What adding DS does to every file is when I'm looking for a file related to the overarching subject of digital sanity, whether it's a file I created and saved recently or something I created and saved years ago, I can easily find it always by typing DS into my finders search box or in the spotlight. I never have to dig around to find any file related to this project. All I have to do is type two letters when searching, and those two letters are DS. Now, I want you to open up the workbook that um, I told you to download when we started. Um, if you don't remember where it is, again, it's um, via the link. It'll take you to Google Drive. And I'm just going to walk you through uh, the, the first two pages so that we can start. you can start to think about what this means for you. OK. So for example, you downloaded this worksheet. And it's titled dash DS dash uh, workshop dash your naming schema. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you. But it means everything to me, right? Because when I'm saving this file, when I created the, um, when I created this worksheet in Pages and saved it as a PDF, I want it to have the keywords DS in it so I can easily search it and find it, right? Because it's part of a project of mine, a big project. So there's always two questions to ask when naming a file. Is the file related to a project? And if not, what word would you use to categorize it? Now, for me, this file, again, is DS. It's part of Digital Sanity. And then I give it you know, an extra uh, keyword workshop. So when I'm searching, oh, yeah, I want to find the, um, all the stuff related to the workshop content, I can easily find it. But for you, it might be you might change it to start with workbook or learning or um, reference or resource because it's more part of that category more part of the reference category or the workshop category. Um, you probably download a lot of PDFs from places, and then you can never find them. I found that that would happen to me a lot. So if I start everything with resource or reference or ebook, then I can always find it because if I just search those terms, they pop up. So if it's not related to a project, what keywords would you like to um, come up with there, which is typically uh, you know, the name of the project, but I would recommend shortening it um, because you're going to want to uh, abbreviate it because long file names can, can get uh, frustrating, as you probably know. And if it's not, um, what word would you use to categorize it? So here's some examples. Digital Sanity is my course. That project for me is DS. Tool Candy is my newsletter that I, that I send out every week. That starts with TC. Gmail Mastery is another course that I have. GM, Work Hacks, which is my company name, WH, Lead Pages, which I feel like is a project in and of itself, which is just a tool that I use to create landing pages and, and things. But I have so many, uh, so much copy and, and, and logos and assets and images and all that kind of stuff that's, that's associated with creating lead pages that it's its own project for me. I start that with LP. Now, if it's not part of a big project, like for example, this document here that you downloaded to your computer that is not part of a project for you, you might call it research or notes um, or a template, whatever you, whatever makes sense to you. For me, I have um, my common word when I download these kind of, you know, you go to someone's site, they're like, download the free worksheet or workbook. Um, I call them all workbooks. So no matter what they call them or anything else, if it's something that it's 
is taking me through step by step and trying to get me to think about something on my own, whether it's, um, you know, what do you want your morning ritual to be? Write it in, you know, write in the blanks. Um, they're all named workbook. So I'm always able to find them. If I remember, oh yeah, I downloaded that workbook um, on how to title blog posts. Uh, where is it? What was that title? Where did I download that from? I just have to search workbook and I know it will show up. Now we're not going to do this now. We're going to sort of do this with our desktop. Um, but when you go come back to this later, the best way I found to figure out what your main project and category keywords are is to, to open up your Finder and look at what's there already and try to group things together. And the goal is to think logically, but also simply because you want to be able to remember it months later. And I feel like we get too clever when we try to name things. Um, we want it to be really specific or we, we want it to sound good when that's not how we will remember it later. So really try to think simply and whatever first keywords pop up in your mind, start to write those down. Okay, so we're going to use everything that we just learned to tidy up our desktop. Okay, so we are going to practice our naming our files and folders with project and category category keywords, starting with renaming all the files and folders sitting on our desktop. By adding easy to remember keywords to each file name and folder, we can safely move all the stuff off our desktop and file it away. Because now we'll be able to find them quickly and easy when we need them by simply searching the easy to remember keywords that we added. It shouldn't take you more than 15 to 30 minutes and by the end, your desktop will look like this. Yes, I'll even show you how to make your dock as beautiful as mine. Look at that dock. Sorry, I'm very, I'm very proud. Okay, so let's get to work. The first thing I want you to do is open up your Finder app. If you have no clue what I'm talking about, your Finder is the blue smiling face icon that's anchored all the way to the left side of your dock. With your Finder app open and active, meaning it's your frontmost window, I want you to hold down the command and shift keys and then hit the letter D. Command and shift and D. So with your Finder app open. This is the shortcut combination that takes you directly to your desktop folder. So there's a ton of shortcut, hidden shortcuts in Finder. I, I can't even get into it now, which I go through extensively in the course, but this one is really good too. They are all amazing. Shift, Command, D will take you right to your desktop folder. And you should see everything that's on your desktop. Now that we're looking at our desktop, I want you, I want to share a little secret. When Apple released the Yosemite software upgrade in late 2014, it included a bunch of new features that most people don't know about. One of those features is batch renaming. It allows you to rename your files um, at once. To batch rename a group of files, select the files, so click, 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 and then right click, and then hit rename five items from the drop down. Select that, and you'll be presented with the batch rename interface. The interface features three main options you can replace text, you can add text, and you can change, um, and you can add text before or after the name and then you can change the format completely. The first two options, replace and add text, sound, you know, work exactly as they sound. You can quickly replace text contained within file names or append text to beginning um, or the end of file names. It works beautifully. Now what we're gonna do is select the files that are similar to one another that you want to rename. So if you're looking at your desktop, like for example here, um, like all these items on my desktop right now are images I downloaded from a stock photo site. I'm going to use Photoshop to add text overlays to them so I can use them in social media posts promoting this webinar or this workshop I like to call it. So all the files here are related to digital sanity and of course digital sanity is the main project that I'm working on right now. Okay, so I selected all of them and then hit rename five items. And I select them all because they're related to the same project, Digital Sanity. Now all I have to do is make sure that the 
add text before name drop downs are selected. So add text on the left there, and at the end you can see the drop down before name. And I add the keywords DS and social before the existing file name. Now, DS is really the main keyword that I need to include, but as I was talking about before, my system has gotten a little bit more um, granular. And so if there's any social images, social posts, social copy, whatever it might be, I add the word social in there as well so I can filter my content even more. And as you can see, it adds DS in social to the beginning of the file names. So here is what it's what my files started like, and then after selecting them all and hitting rename and adding DS social, this is what they look like now. So this is what they were like on my desktop before. After mass rename, quickly, this is how they look. So I don't I don't change the whole file name, I just add keywords to the beginning using the mass rename tool, which they just launched. I mean, it's crazy. I used to use all these other apps to do it, and now Mac does it natively. It's awesome. Now, I want you to go from your desktop folder, the place that you're at right now, to the place where you store and organize most of your files. For me, that's Dropbox. But you might store everything in documents, which I don't recommend. You should always put everything in the cloud or in a different store, cloud storage service, like Apple's iCloud Drive. So where the place where you save most of your stuff, again, for me, that's Dropbox, but it might be different for you. I want you to create a new folder and title it Desktop and put parentheses around it. Now, I'm sure you've done this before, but this is new this time, because we're not just going to dump all the files in it. We're going to rename them and put them there. And now I want you to open a new tab in your Finder window by using the shortcut command T. So first, we created a desktop folder titled desktop in parentheses, so it pulls it up to the top of our file list. And now in our Finder window, hold down the command key and hit the letter T. This will give you a new tab. You can move back and forth a lot of people don't know that you can have tabs. It's just like Chrome, you know, you browse, open up a new tab, not a window. Your Finder has the same functionality. All you have to do is hit Command-T and it'll open up a new tab in the same window. So you can move back and forth between them, okay? So you can click back and forth. Instead of two windows, they're just two tabs, right? Just like in your browser. I don't want you to simply move all your files from your desktop to this new folder. I want you to rename them first by adding project or category keywords to the very front of the existing file name, like I did here. And then I want you to drag them from your desktop to your new desktop folder. So after you rename them, add text, DS, social, and hit rename. And then I'm going to drag them to Oops, wrong folder. <laughs> Drag them to my desktop, my new desktop folder. So they went from my desktop to my new desktop folder. Because it doesn't matter where you save it, because we named them, we named it right. It doesn't matter where we save it because we named it right. So if you love things in folders um, and love to organize your stuff, I think that that's great. I do too. Um, but as you're working and, and, and getting work done and, and, and doing the things that you need to do, the stuff just gets messy, right? But if we name them properly, we don't have to have everything organized in order to find things. We end up organizing things perhaps because we like things organized and we like to put things in folders and we like to make things, um, you know, kind of grouped in a way where we can look at a whole project and it feels like, um, you know, it feels like a sane, happy place to be. Uh, but if you're not that kind of person, it doesn't really matter if it's in the proper folder or not. Again, as long as you can find it by searching the right keywords. So if you can get that down and categorize things properly and then use that category system to create keywords and name your files in a way that makes sense, um, simple sense really, then it doesn't really matter where they exist. 
and you're going to keep selecting similar files, renaming and moving all that stuff to your newly created desktop folder until your co computer desktop looks like this. Cool? I'd pop out, but I just we're going to finish this last piece, and then I'll take uh, Q&A. Now, the last piece we're going to talk about, the final thing that you can do to go the extra mile and clean up your desktop, and this is brand new to the this workshop. Um, I just added it this week. Is to clean up, declutter, and organize your dock, that thing on the bottom or the side of your screen. I find that most people's docs either look like this, the same way as they did when they first got their computer, uh, which includes all the default Apple applications lining the bottom of the screen, right? But when's the last time you opened up and used iBooks or Apple Maps or FaceTime app? Likely never, and even more likely not in the last week, month, or even year. The apps you display in your dock should only be those that you use every day, or at least the ones that you use once a week. It's kind of like clearing everything off your desk that you don't really need to access all the time. It just creates this extra clutter that distracts you um, from the work that you need to get done because all these things that you never use are sitting there staring at you all day. It's really easy to declutter your dock. To remove apps from your dock, hover your cursor over the app icon like so. And then right click on the app icon by holding down the option key while you click. You can also right click using your trackpad or mouse, but out of the box, right click isn't, isn't set up um, in system preferences for the mouse um, or the trackpad. So if you're having trouble bringing up the options dialog box by, by right clicking either on your trackpad or on the mouse, it might not be set up. Um, so you need to hold down the control key while you click in order to open up that dialog box. So to right click on the app icon by holding down the option key while you click, and then you hover over options and click remove from dock and it will remove it from your dock. It's amazing. It's, if, if you know this, you're like, duh, Julia. Um, if you don't, your mind's blown right now, right? Did you know that you could remove stuff from your dock that quickly and easily? Uh, but not. Mac is full of all these fun little things that you can do to, you know, not only one, make it easier to navigate, but there's so many fun little tricks like this. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to keep going. Hold down the control key while you click on apps and remove them by selecting the remove from dock option in that pop-up. Everything that you don't use, if you don't use Apple Reminders, get rid of it. If you don't really use numbers, remove it. If you don't buy books, get it out of there. Okay, just keep right-clicking and removing. Remove, remove, remove. We're being minimalist here. If you don't use it, remove it. You'll still be able to access it via applications. You're not deleting the app. You're just removing it from your dock. You can move the apps around and organize them too according to your preferences by clicking and dragging apps from left or right. So if you kind of want you know, your calendar and uh, your browser together, you would put them next to each other, right? So you could organize it based on um, what your preferences are. And you can add items to your dock by dragging the application from the applications folders into your dock. So if there are applications you use a lot, like for me, Chrome, you want to drag it into your dock from the applications folder. Now, they both, it's, it exists in both places. It's in your dock, and it's also still in your applications folder. It just creates that shortcut um, so that you can open it in your dock. Cool? I want you to have a clean dock with only apps that you use by the end of this, by the end of the day today. It makes such a huge difference. Like getting all the excess stuff out of your way um, frees up all this mind space because you're not like, oh, where is that? You know, where is that? Uh, I need to open up Chrome and it's right next to an app that you never open. Doesn't make any sense. Get rid of it. Get it out of your sight. All right, that is it for the learning part of the presentation. Of course, I have a huge course uh, that helps you clear your clutter, find your files, master your Mac. It's the most modern 
training program out there for designing your perfect digital workflow. It's amazing. I put so much energy and effort and work into it. It's self-paced. Um, it first walks you through decluttering and then organizing and then automation tools. Your computer will feel like new by the end of it. Um, so if you're interested in taking a look at the course, there's a um, sales page or more like an information page that has all the information that you need, exactly what's in the course, a place where you can ask questions and Q&A. So it's wrk.hk slash digital sanity course. And I'll email everyone at the end of this with the links uh, just so you have it. And as special bonuses, you know, you'll be part of the Slack community, which is great. It's a place where I post resources, um, you know, new updates. Uh, to both, you know, the Mac, like if Apple updates its OS and there's new features and functionality that you let you organize, um, arrange your stuff uh, more easily. I'll post it there. If there's new apps or tools that are on sale or just really awesome, I post it there. And it's also a place for you to ask questions and just let me know um, what's going on with you so I can help you hands on. And I'm also in there every Thursday from 12 to 2 uh, if you want to be, you know, be able to chat live with me. I also uh, am offering a one-on-one -on -one private coaching session that you can redeem over the next year that you can just schedule right into my calendar. And then just lots of fun early access stuff. You'll be part of my first 50 customers. Uh, you get special treatment and perks. I'm working on some awesome deals with, with apps that, I'm, that I will share with you guys and solely with you guys uh, that will not be available to future students. And then um, also if... Uh, the price will also be uh, just continue to rise. It was 95 and now it's 195 um, and it'll just keep going up, up and up. So if you're thinking about the course, just get on board now because it's just gonna get more expensive and I'm gonna constantly, this is a passion of mine. It's not something that I created. I'm just gonna leave. I'm gonna constantly be updating it. You'll always get value from this course. And you stay till the end. Uh, so here are your free workshop goodies. Again, I will email this to you after this course. So if you're trying to frantically write this down, don't worry about it. But it's wrk.hk slash DS workshop freebies, um, where you can download all the free workbooks. Cool. All right. So I am going to pop out and stop sharing my screen. screen. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to go up through some of the checks before. Blah, blah, blah. Kelty, I'm a graphic designer and picture framer in New in North Carolina. I almost said New York City because I'm so used to it. I've had Macs for years and have um, years and years of files and data just a mess. Um, I, Kelty, I feel your pain. I hope that you're still here. Let me make sure. Yes, Kelty's still here. Yay. Um, I feel your pain because it seems to be, and I was thinking about this course in terms of graphic designers because um, digital fi photo files are the hardest because at least with documents and PDFs, PDFs if they're OCR, have a bunch of data in them that if you're searching, you'd probably be able to find it. If it's a proposal or something, you'll be able to find some sort of text that's in the document. But for photos, it's all about the name. If you don't name it properly, you won't be able to find it. Um, now, Kelty, I'll tell you in the course, and I'll just tell you right now kind of that process, which is um, finding everything that you haven't accessed in over a year, buying a brand new external hard drive um, that doesn't have anything else on it, and then moving all of that stuff to the external hard drive that you haven't accessed in a year. So what that does is it clears up a lot of space so that you can find um, what you're looking for a lot faster because it's not being cluttered by all this stuff that is old that you probably don't want to throw away because you might need, but you don't need to have access to it at the drop of a hat, most likely. You can choose more than a year. You can maybe say a year and a half, depending upon how your system works, but just get that stuff on. Uh, I, have, I have all these photos and all this stuff I created that is important to me, right, um, that of course I would have just throw away, but I didn't really need, and I moved all that stuff to an external hard drive. It's, that was like a year and a half ago. I may have plugged in that hard drive once or twice to try to find something specific. Um, most likely you will not need to
to access any of that stuff. And then it makes searching for the things you're looking for so much easier because it's not cluttered by everything else. It's like hoarders, right? I mean, we just keep collecting all of this junk that makes finding what we need, like the pair of scissors, really difficult because there's all this other crap in there, right? Um, scissors that don't work, scissors that are broken, yeah, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, photos. It really is important how you name them. Batch rename will be a lifesaver. Cool. So I just read your comments. Healthy. Is there any other questions? As part of those resource, those uh, resources, which um, I can post. Oops. Um, as part of those resources is the list of uh, special characters that I use in their order so that you can have kind of a place to start in terms of special characters as well. Any more questions? Kelty, it's all you. And then Francisco. What's up, Francisco? How you been? All right, y'all, if there are any more comments, I'm going to let you go. We're under time, which I'm going to always try to be. I'll keep making this workshop better and better. And I will email everyone with a link to the replay and then also um, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that um, you might want to ask now. I think my internet might be conking out. I'm not sure because the new tab won't open. All right, everybody. Thank you, Kelty. I appreciate you. And Francisco. I'll see you at the next workshop, which is going to have new awesome stuff in February. So be on the lookout for that.